Channel 2 News special presentation. Your source for politics across Alaska. This is Alaska's Political Pipeline with Steve McDonald. Welcome to the Pipeline, broadcasting from the Al Bramstead studio in Midtown Anchorage. Tonight on the program, we'll meet the Eagle River lawmaker who refused to support the House majority's operating budget, and we'll talk to her about the price she paid for her no vote. And is a rebellion brewing? Adam Pinska reports on a new attempt to push back against the federal government. But first, a recap of some of the top political stories that made the news this week. State lawmakers will now have two Medicaid bills to debate over the final month of the session. This week, Governor Walker said he'll introduce legislation asking to expand Medicaid to some 40,000 Alaskans who currently have no health care. Earlier in the session, the governor inserted language in the operating budget that would have expanded coverage. However, that was stripped out by House lawmakers, who then told the governor to put his request in a bill. The other Medicaid legislation is in the Senate, but instead of expanding the program, it only calls for reforms to Medicaid regulations. In a unanimous vote Tuesday night, the Matsu Assembly voted down a proposed resolution that would have let voters decide this October if there should be a ban on commercial marijuana operations. Mayor Larry DeVilbus introduced the resolution during this week's meeting. He says ballot measure two legalizing marijuana did not pass in the valley, so he wanted to see how the borough felt about the commercial sale of it. In January, the borough created a marijuana advisory committee to guide city leaders through the regulating process. Assembly members all agreed that they should let that committee do the job it was created to do. A bill passed by the Alaska House gives legislators an extra two months to file annual financial disclosure forms with the state. The legislation that moves the filing deadline from March 15th to May 15th was authored by Anchorage Representative Mike Hawker. The Republican lawmaker says moving the deadline back allows public officials to provide more complete and updated financial information to the state. But some members of the minority argued that legislators owe it to the public to provide financial information during the legislative session as well. The bill now goes on to the Senate. And it's still very early in the legislative process, but a Senate committee has voted to do away with the state reimbursement of local school bonds. Currently, if a community approves a school bond, the state matches up to 70% of the cost of that bond. But the bill passed by the Senate Education Committee would suspend the state subsidy over the next five years. Members of the Education Committee say suspending the reimbursement will save the state about $100 million a year. The Anchorage School District has a bond issue on the April 7th election ballot. Some lawmakers are concerned that without the state match, it could affect the outcome of the vote. A little later on in our program, we'll be speaking to Anchorage School Superintendent Ed Graff about the bond proposal on the ballot. Federal overreach, those are fighting words for many politicians in Alaska. That fight is mostly limited to a lot of inflamed rhetoric aimed at the federal government or more specifically the Obama administration, whenever someone feels the feds are interfering in the state's business. Now a state lawmaker is looking to take, the, take things to a whole new level our Juno correspondent, Adam Pinsker, has the story. Over the years, several resolutions have been passed by the Alaska legislature condemning federal overreach on issues such as oil and gas or management of Alaska's lands. But Representative Shelley Hughes says her latest resolution carries some teeth. The states formed the federal government, not the other way around. Federal overreach is on the minds of lawmakers in Juneau once again. Representative Shelley Hughes' bill, House Concurrent Resolution 4, enhances Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution by establishing a countermand amendment to the Constitution, giving states veto power over a single issue. So I'll give an example. Back when um, President um, Bush put forward um, No Child Left Behind, a lot of states were not happy with them. In fact, I don't recall one state being happy with that. Under this proposal, if one state passes a resolution stating that a federal law is not in its best interest, 29 other states would have 18 months to sign on to the resolution in order to nullify the law. I, I think we need to tread very, very carefully on the idea that we're going to allow states' majorities to overturn 
the Supreme Court decisions. Hughes bill and its companion legislation to the Senate received a hearing last week. Senator Bill Wolikowski expressed concern that the countermand could be used to unravel laws such as Roe versus Wade and civil rights legislation. But Hughes says she's seeking bipartisan support for this measure because she believes that's what it will take to get something like this passed. Article 5 efforts that have been more conservative in nature, nature just have ours on it. And guess what? You don't re you never you can't get your 38 states. You have to have blue, red and purple states to reach that 38. 38 is the threshold under Article 5 required to amend the U.S. Constitution. Representative Hughes says the countermand clause will make the federal government take notice that even if a constitutional convention is never called, state sovereignty was once the foundation of the United States. In the first 100, 150 years of our country, it was more prestigious to be a member of a state legislature than it was to be a member of Congress. Representative Hughes says 17 other states have expressed support for this measure. Now her resolution still needs to clear two more committees before getting a vote on either the House or Senate floors. For Alaska's Political Pipeline, I'm Adam Pinsker. Up next on the pipeline, there's some big decisions voters have to make come April 7th. One of them is to decide the fate of millions of dollars in school bonds. We'll examine the bond proposal when we come back. On April 7th, Anchorage voters go to the polls to make a number of important decisions, among them whether to approve a $59 million school bond. The money would pay for renovations at eight different schools in Anchorage and Eagle River. Here to discuss the bond proposals, Anchorage School Superintendent Ed Graff. Thanks for coming on the program, Ed. Thank you for having me, Steve. Um, how do you characterize this bond package in, in, in its overall purpose? How do you characterize it? Well, I, first of all, I believe it's a great bond package. Um, you know, one of the things we've really been focused on is making sure that we're very responsible with our uh, proposals that we put out there. And um, so this is absolutely uh, a needs-based package. It focuses on our schools that are of the, the greatest need or have the greatest need and really prioritizes our, our, um, our resources and making sure that we have schools that are educationally adequate for our students and have a strong facility infrastructure and mechanical support that's needed to run an efficient building. Now, looking through and reading the, uh, the description of the ballot, it sounds like these schools are older schools. One of them is Gladys Wood Elementary School, which has been around for a while. Yeah. Give us an idea of some of the changes Gladys Wood go, uh, would undergo if it's, this bond's approved. So you're right. We have eight schools that are on this bond proposition, uh, four headliner projects, as I like to call them, or four schools, mm -hmm. uh, Gladys Wood being one of them. The interesting thing about Gladys Wood for me is I actually used to teach there uh, a little over 20 years ago. And uh, one of the most telling things about Gladys Wood is the layout of it. It was built in the early 70s at a time when uh, there was a big push for kind of an open concept. And so when you walk into the building at the front office, you're right in the middle of the library and the front office right there. And it's the main through fare for the school. So there's a lot of uh, transitional things that are happening in a building without walls. Um, and so when you look at the different classrooms, they're set up into pods. And the particular pod that I was in, I was the last classroom within the pod. So I'd take my class of students through two other classrooms before we actually got to our room. Um, and, you know, so there was some challenges. There were some challenges with that disruption to yeah. the other students. Um, but even in, within the classroom, um, you'll see that there are not, uh, they don't have shelving within the school, uh, the classrooms. And so you have to create your own shelving through movable, movable kind of cabinetry. Um, so it's just not as conducive to the type of learning environment that our students need today. Yeah, the uh, renovations would include building walls to enclose the classrooms. Yeah, you'd have, cla classrooms. You'd have classroom doors, you'd have, uh, yeah, you know, the library would be enclosed, <laughs> uh, the front office would be enclosed. Yeah. We still want that welcoming feel, mm -hmm. but really focusing on, you know, the educational benefits and, and needs of students is what um, a good portion of this renovation would do for the school. And this is extending the life of the building, yeah. of all these buildings. Yeah, we talk about the um, building life extension projects. That's kind of the, the term we use for them. So we're looking to add 30, you know, 30 plus years to our schools mm -hmm. um, because we know that they're going to be around for a while and we want to make sure that they're properly maintained and they meet the, the educational needs of our students. The school district's been kind of on a, on a winning streak the last few years. If you go back to the 2011 election, there were three bond proposals for the school district on that election ballot. 
Two of them were defeated, one passed. But then, since then, 2012, 13, and 14, school bonds have passed, and passed by wide margins. Was there a, a philosophical change in the approach by the district when it came to constructing these bond proposals? Yeah, we took a hard look after um, you know only two of the three bonds passed uh, in 2011. And what we came up with was a, a much more analytical approach, a, a very objective approach to how we put our proposals forward. Mm -hmm. We developed essentially two assessment tools for evaluating the schools. Uh, we termed them facility condition indices and educational adequacy indexes. And what that means is uh, for your FCIs, we look at the schools and we look at the infrastructure of the school, we look at the mechanical equipment within the facility, and we determine what, what is this, um, how, how, how great of a need is there to repair some of these items within the school. For example, if there's a roof that's failing, you know, that gets a certain rating as to uh, how great of a need there is to, to get that fixed. And then we also have the educational adequacy tool, which looks at the environment and how that um, is set up as it relates to education. And in the example of Gladys Wood, you know, the open, openness of mm -hmm. it, the lack of walls or the, the lack of cabinetry and the, um, the space that's utilized, it's not as adequate as it needs to be. And mm -hmm. so they get a, a ranking or a score, and then from there that is combined and the schools are prioritized. So what we have in this bond proposal are eight greatest priorities. Um, four main schools, Rabbit Creek, Mountain View, Gladys Wood and Turnigan Elementary, mm -hmm. and then we have four additional schools that have emerging needs, um, but in most cases, if not all cases, they all have structural deficiencies or mechanical needs that are going to be improving um, the efficiency of our schools and making sure that they're adequate for our students. Yeah. Now, if, if the bond proposal passes uh, and the state subsidizes the bond, which it has in years past, Property owners will see an increase of $5.59 on a $100,000 home, as if there's a $100,000 home in Anchorage, right? right? Uh, if the state doesn't match, then the state, then the tax is increased by $14. If a voter goes to the polls and is concerned about maybe the economy being a little bit soft right now in Alaska, uh, the massive budget deficit down in Juneau, what do you what do you tell them? Well, I would go back to, again, how we came about mm -hmm. um, putting this proposal forward. It's not based on debt reimbursement. Certainly, we've been grateful and appreciative of what we've received from the legislature in the last 30 years, but these needs are not going to go away. Um, you know, we, we prioritized our schools for this bond based on what they have uh, for needs, and there's a, a very clear metric to determine that. And so I think if I could assure the voters that what they're getting are a needs-based approach. Um, the other thing is that we went through several kind of variations of what these um, project proposals should look like. And so it's not just the first one that came out. You know, we looked at um, you know, the extreme to the, the lowest and made the decision based again on uh, the most responsible approach for mm -hmm. not only our students and our schools, but the voters in the community. Mm -hmm. These are these are schools that we expect to have around for many years to come. Mm -hmm. And we know that our schools are greatly supported by the Anchorage community and voters, and we want to make sure that we're giving them a product that they can feel uh, proud of and, and actually are going to get to use. If they are our prospective parents, you know, having their children in the school, if they're uh, grandparents, their grandchildren will be in the school, and if they're a community member, you know, a lot of our school facilities are utilized by our community and the general public. And so we want them to um, see the value and the pride that we take in our schools and make sure that they're um, supporting that. All right, Ed Graff. Superintendent of the Anchorage School District, thanks so much for, for being here, and good luck to you on April 7th. Thank you, Steve. All right, thanks very much. Next on the pipeline, she voted against the budget. Now she's in hot water with the House leadership. We'll talk to Eagle River Representative Laura Reinbold about what happened. That's when the pipeline continues after the break. When you're a member of the state legislature, you can pretty much vote the way you want to on issues, except if you're a member of the majority party and the issue before you is the operating budget. In that case, majority members are expected to vote yes in support of the budget. Failing to do so can mean dire consequences for a legislator. Eagle River Representative Laura Reinbold found that out after she voted against the Republican majority's operating budget when it came to the House floor last week. This week, she felt the wrath of the House leadership. Representative Reinbold now joins us from Juneau. Representative, when you voted against the budget, you knew there would be repercussions, right? Well, I had heard there was going to be repercussions. I had specifically asked what they were going to be, and I didn't know if it was going to be a bluff or not. When you join the majority caucus, you're said you will be kicked out if you don't 
vote for the budget, but they don't specify exactly what that means. But it is a rule, whether the Republicans are in power or the Democrats, for years and years, the majority party uh, has to have the support of its members when it comes to the budget and when it comes to that final floor vote. So uh, you, now you said you voted against the operating budget because it was still too high. You wanted deeper cuts. Is that right? That's absolutely right. And it's the caucus is more than just one unwritten rule. There's principles that we develop in that caucus. For example, I'll, I'll name a few of our, our guiding principles. One, it says we're going to live within their means. Why I voted no is because I don't believe that this budget is living within our means. It also, one of our caucus principles is that we will develop a long-range plan. I have not seen that plan. Once again, another principle of the caucus is that it says that uh, we will save for future generations. How is spending three to four billion dollars a year saving for future generations? That's the question I have for my caucus leadership. Now you had chances to offer amendments during the floor debate. Did you do that? Well, decorum, you're taught that if, if certain names are not on the amendment, that the leadership will not vote for them. And people are expected to go lock and step with leadership. And, uh, and, and that's basically what the floor decorum is about. And Speaker Chenault, during a news conference earlier this week, he said you had plenty of opportunities to propose budget reductions during committee hearings. Did you do that then? Did you offer any kind of amendments? Yes, I did. And let me just explain the process of the subcommittees, because a lot of people probably don't know. But if you're a finance member, you get a couple budgets. Then you get to pick members or your assigned members from the co-chairs. I had asked for education. I had also asked for the university and fish and game. I was given DEC, the Judiciary, and Labor and Commerce. Two of the committees I understood that the person who was chairing did not have the same fiscal conservative values that I have. And I had been under this in particular representative for two years. And my amendments the past two years were met with chill, not interested. The only thing I was able to do was intent language for the university. Once again, my amendments were met with chill. Then about an hour beforehand, um, I was told that my amendment wasn't on a legal memo, so they weren't going to accept it. So there's a lot more to the story, Steve. But isn't that just part of the legislative process, the democratic process here, in terms of working within uh, the confines of uh, legislative rules, things like that? Well, let's say, do, or do, does an unwritten rule trump a principle, Steve? You know, that's what I need to ask. And also, I think it's very, very important. When we first went into caucus in November, I asked, what percentage are we going to take out of the Constitutional Budget Reserve? And how, what is our target budget? Those questions were not answered. So basically what they're asking is in exchange for power, can we have unlimited access to revenues and, and all our savings? And to me, that rule needs to be questioned. We need to know a target. I think the rule would be much fairer if we had a target. What has been your punishment from House leadership? What have they done? Very harsh. Yesterday, um, my staff came in to clean out their office. Their computers were, were shut down. They were terminated immediately. I was amazed. I hadn't even had a chance to talk to one of my staff, my part-time staffers uh, that are taking care of my constituents in Eagle River. I didn't even have the opportunity to tell her. Uh, very sad how swift uh, it, it came through. I was stripped of uh, Joint Armed Services rules, ledge counsel, and one of my most favorite is the Vice Chair of Education. So pretty harsh punishment for sticking up for what I believe in. How is this going to affect you as a legislator and doing your job for the folks back in Eagle River? I'm going to keep my promise. I absolutely I have a wonderful staff. I have, I have a, a, one staff that's been with me since day one, and she's, she's as good as three. So we're going to be stronger and leaner. Um, I am absolutely going to be working on what I've promised my constituents, and that's a decrease of dependency on government, everybody, agencies, people. So I promise I'm going to continue to work on that. I'm also passionate about education reform, so I absolutely be working. I have a, a, a Common Core Symposium unveiling the concerns of the Common Core tomorrow. On my own dime, I'm flying to Sitka. I'll be back at 6 in the morning and uh, back for floor session on, um, on Friday. I also have a symposium on the Common Core in Anchorage on the 28th. 
I will be attending meetings, I will be working on legislation, and I will most importantly be empowering the people. I am going to open the government up for transparency and be posting on my Facebook and letting people know the bills that are coming up. Okay, and how does this affect your relationship with the House leadership from here on in? We've got a little bit more than a month of uh, the session to go. Is this going to impact your relationship with the House leadership? Well, certainly it will, but I have a lot of fabulous relationships in this building. I'm going to be working with people of all parties. I will be working with anybody interested in taking this fiscal situation. It's a crisis that we're in. Anybody who's interested in taking this seriously, I'm going to be here working every day for the people. Okay. Laura Reinbeld, uh, the representative from Eagle River. We will uh, keep an eye on how things go the rest of the session. Good luck to you. Thanks for joining us here on the pipeline. Thanks for having me on, Steve. All righty. Laura Reinbelt from Juno. When we come back, we'll take a look at some of your comments from the past week. You're watching The Pipeline. Welcome back. Austin Baird spending a few days in Juno, so Tracy Sinclair is joining us with your comments from the web. Tracy. Well, Steve, it was a busy week for our web crew. Here are some of the highlights. One topic that caught our viewers' attention and inspired many to comment was the governor's proposal to expand Medicaid. It was a mixed bag of yays and nays. Fran McDonald said, why would any intelligent, responsible adult invest funds to grow our econ economy, thus providing more jobs and better education, when he could just keep throwing those funds into the ever-deepening pit that is government handouts? But Billy Susan Longfellow spoke up on the other side. I'm betting all these negative commenters have health insurance. When you live in fear every day that you might have to go see a doctor or worse, go to the ER, you know that Medicaid expansion is the right thing to do. This benefits working people, not people looking for handouts. The story about Representative Laura Reinbold's punishment for voting no on the operating budget also garnered a lot of attention and quite a few comments, most of them supporting Reinbold, like Davina Spafford Stewart. She said she did what she felt was best and needed to be done and what she promised the voters she would do. More politicians on both sides need to start doing that more. Good on her. Stephen Dristy was a little more blunt. Translated, vote how I tell you or you're out of my group. Sounds like a spoiled six-year-old brat. Can we torch Juno yet? We need to contain the spread of stupid before it infects the rest of us. And a national story that we posted also lit a fire under some Alaskans. The report that Donald Trump was deciding between running for president and renewing his contract with NBC. Again, most Alaskans seem to be in agreement. Shane Vane says, this could be awesome. Imagine Trump using his business acumen as our president. I bet he would have the USA converted into a corporation, declare it bankrupt, strip its assets, cancel its debts, and then form a new country with the tallest White House ever. Long live Emperor Trump. Or a little more succinctly and a little less sarcastically, Stephen Lanners said, stick with the apprentice, something you can do, or run for president just for our entertainment. There's always something to talk about, Steve. Right you are, Tracy. Thanks very much. Once again, Austin's in Juno and continue to gathering, gather the best and most interesting bits for the Pipeline blog. Last week, we brought you the story on Representative Ledoux's bill to change the military code of conduct. This week on the Pipeline blog, you can hear Representative Chris Tuck's opinion on that idea. And Austin did a question and answer session with Senator Dan Sullivan about why he signed that letter to Iranian officials. All that and more on the blog. Go to KTUU.com, click on the AK Pipeline in the trending section at the top of the page, and that'll get you there. That's it for this edition of Alaska's Political Pipeline. From all of us here at Channel 2 News, have a great week. Yeah.